Hey everybody, what's going on? Install Education back for another year. Uh, we're going to start this year off right with uh, letting you save some money. So two of our favorite uh, people are the Core360 Belt and Human Locomotion, which is Dr. Thomas Shad. So don't forget, if you use the code Gestalt for the Core360 Belt, you get $5 off all belts except for the ohm track sensors. So Brett, what about what, what are some of the Michaud's favorite, uh, some of your favorite Michaud uh, gadgets? Well, I mean, he's got a he's got a trunk full of gadgets, but I think my my favorite one definitely would be the we I mean, we use the Toe Pro quite a bit, mm -hmm. uh, the Toe Pro, and then I think the Varus and Valgus Post have really given people like a nice option if they're not want to take that leap into like a customized orthotic to kind of um, you know a good option for the patient, but also for, to let them kind of like you know bring the power back to the clinician to kind of decide where to post it. And so I, I think those are the two probably ones uh, of Tom's stuff that I love. And of course his tie, I can't get enough of his of his human locomotion. I mean the book is still to this day pure insanity. So. Beautiful. Yeah. Don't forget to use the code Gestalt on both those, the Core 360 belt, and then also Human Locomotion links are in all of our podcasts. And we hope you guys like today's episode. All right, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Gestalt Education Show. Today we are in, uh, well, technically it's Oceanside, California. Correct. correct? Oceanside. Okay. Our Uber driver was giving us a little bit of uh, a, <laughs> uh, really? well, he was talking about how it's Carlsbad up until here and then Oceanside, sure. whatever. But, but yeah. the, the address says Oceanside. And as you can see, if you're watching on the YouTube, we're here at the Titles Performance Institute uh, with uh, the legend himself. So uh, Dr. Greg Rose. So uh, Greg, I, I first kind of heard you talk. Uh, it was actually the first time I met you was at uh, at my alma mater, the best chiropractic school on planet Earth, Cleveland Chiropractic College in Kansas City, the at, the, there. <laughs> at the FTCA uh, uh, seminar. But anyway, uh, you're you're kind of a legendary, um, not only for being an awesome chiropractor, but for uh, your your work in engineering previously and then kind of bridging the gap into this performance aspect and so uh we're on this insane i mean brett this is this is an insane yeah, we facility just got a tour. It is, uh, it's uh, it, everything that you could ever imagine if you enjoy golf it's a and, typical chiropractic office yeah right, right. yeah a, exactly. you do have a you do have a, a great table there is a, sitting yeah, over there's there. a pelvic bench over there so i mean yeah. <laughs> straight from palmer right i mean holy smokes you know uh, a palmer grab when you see him that's exactly right so i uh, used to build those when i went to palmer because my engineering i used to build those and sell them to other students that's how i made money was building palmer. that's called a racket that's, That's it. Amazing. That's called a pyramid exactly. scheme. The question I want to start off with is, how many times do you lay uh, one of your uh, PGA golfers on there and give them an old HIO? Uh, daily? Yeah. Thank goodness. <laughs> we always say we got to do it once a month just to kind of, you know, appease the gods yeah, and make absolutely. them know. So anyway, we started off the rails, which is usually what we get to. But uh, we really wanted to focus today. Uh, we're going to probably talk about biomechanics. And we're going to talk about those other things. But you've talked uh, at Agnosium about that on other podcasts. But today we wanted to kind of talk about uh, how you got from opening up this golf specific clinic in, on the East Coast to Oceanside, California, and, and maybe some of the lessons that we can take back to our own clinic. Clinics and, and how do we scale things and how do we make them these big dreams really happen? So, yeah. can you maybe just give us a, a quick kind of a recap on your journey from uh, from from uh, from East Coast to uh, to West Coast? I'm going to make it really simple. I I always feel like uh, you need to be good at what you do, but you also need to be lucky, yeah. right? And I never uh, like to underestimate how important the luck part is. You know, I started my chiropractic practice in 1996, and my practice was called Advantage Golf. Everyone was like, you're crazy. You can't just have a practice just working with golfers. Because back then, nobody did that, right? And I was like, what's the worst thing that happens? I can just go be a regular chiropractor if it doesn't work, right? Sure. Well, who started in 1996? You know, Tiger Woods. I mean, it was... I don't want to say it was luck, but it was 100% luck, right? So when he when he starts in 1996, everyone's like, man, this kid's like an athlete. Because they the golfers were an athlete. They didn't think of them as athletes. And everybody was like, is anybody like studying golfers and what they can do? And I'm like... Hey, you know, I'm doing this. And uh, the interest, I mean, look what happened to the purses in golf. And look what happened to, like, every, when Tiger came on the scene, the whole the whole sport changed. Right. right. What year did you graduate chiropractic school? So it was, it was I was 9-6 uh, in, the, in the spring, and I opened up in the fall. Okay. And basically, wow. it was, if you think about it, uh, um, I, you know, I, like I said, Tiger created this, uh, I don't want to say it was cool – for the cool kids to play golf, but right. that's really what happened. Yeah, right. you know what I mean. Right. Like back then, like when, when we were young. I mean, how old are you? 
Uh, about to be 46. I'm 45. Okay. Yeah. 30. Okay, so I'm the old man. So I'm 52. <laughs> so, uh, you know, when I was going to school, like, you know, the cool kids played football, basketball, and then if you didn't have any talent, you know, you could go do some soccer and some golf and stuff like that. Tennis, that was kind of, yeah. yeah, something like that. Because there wasn't as much money in those sports. Sure. Well, the world's changed now. You're right. right. I mean, you know, golfers are some of the highest paid athletes in the world and guys like Tiger made it cool. So now you had all these kids and parents going, I want my kids to play golf. Right. And I want someone who knows what they're doing to help them do that. And I'm telling you, it was just like this. It was just the perfect time in history to start this type of business. So I don't want to underestimate how important that is. Right. Well, I think that uh, people who get lucky, what yeah. they do, they give them chance. They give themselves a better chance to get lucky more times. You and know, like I said, you still have to be good at what you do. But yeah. that luck is so important. You need a break. Here. So yeah. important. Yeah. So important. Right? So if we watch like the NFL game from like the 1980s compared to now. I mean, it literally looks like an NFL game compared to high school. Right. Golf's a little bit like that too. So you look at the players. Like I'm telling you, like I used to work with, you know, I was working with PGA tour players before I even graduated Palmer. And when, uh, and I can tell you that's where, but when I, when I think back then, you know, a famous story, Brad Faxon, oh, yeah. Chi Rodriguez came up to him when he got on tour and put his arm around him and said, son, I'm going to help you. Uh, stay out of here as long as you want. You see that trailer over there? And it was the Health South trailer. It was a fitness trailer. He's like, stay out of that trailer. <laughs> Nothing but damage is going to happen in there. Now, Brad's one of the biggest fitness fanatics in the right. world, right? So it was giving advice to the wrong person there. But that was kind of the thought. It was There was a few guys like Gary Player, Nick Faldo, or they like starting to do some fitness. But back then, it was kind of like, dude, we drive carts, we drink beer, we play golf, yeah. right? That's, that, that was most amateur golfers, yeah, right? Yeah, right. And, uh, but then all of a sudden, this like... Man, this pretty athletic kid with all this speed shows up, and and uh, all of a sudden all this money starts coming in the sport, and people are like, you know, we could take this serious. Like, what if a real athlete started to play the sport? Now, if you go look at the PGA Tour today, I mean, dude, these guys are huge, and they're like, they're that's like that's I I feel like I'm at an NFL. So, you know, you look at guys like John Rahm, and you look at guys like Dustin Johnson. I mean, these guys are multi-sport athletes that are competitive. That you know, if you're just going to go out there as a kid and just learn to play golf and just hit it straight. And then you run into an athlete that can do the same thing. You have no chance. Right. And you just have no chance. And that's right. what the world's become. What do you think about the present day physique of the golfer? So like, we're, we're, we're training them. Like, listen, we work with a bunch of N M MLB teams and we work with a bunch of NFL teams, quarterbacks, pitchers, golfers. I, I don't do anything different. I mean, right. I train them the same way. They're, they're explosive rotary athletes. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I mean, that, that's in the gym and it, that's the, the definition of an athlete, an athlete is you can do multiple sports, you can do things, right? And, you know, rotary athletes are rotary athletes. Of course, there's particular little fine motor skills in each of the sports that are important, but um, you need explosive power from your lower body and be able to transfer that up through the chain. You know, that's, that's what great athletes do. Well, I think I heard you uh, speak at a World Golf Summit one time, actually in San Diego, and you were mm -hmm. talking about, you know, when you're at a young age, one of the first things you want to do is you want to build athleticism. And then, then you are working toward you know, sports specific and that's the long-term athletic development LTAD. That's, uh, you know, the philosophy that most of the governing bodies of, of youth development, Olympic sports, um, go by a, a gentleman by the name of Istvan Bali, who used to run the Hungarian Institute of Sport mm -hmm. kind of founded that, that term LTAD. He's on our advisor, board, great guy. And one of the principles in long-term athletic development is athlete first, right? So, you know, I think people see Tiger Woods in our sport here in golf and they go, oh, hell, he was on tour when he was six. You know, that's what they're thinking. Right. right? So they're like, you know, if I've got a six-year-old, they got to just play golf. Right. And the data is just so completely opposite. Right. You know, it's my, my favorite example of this is in Korea. So we do a lot of golf is obviously crazy in Korea. And um, people in Korea, you know, I'm, there are certain cultures that will outwork you, man, their work <laughs> ethic is crazy. Like they'll go work 10 hours on the driving range. Right. But if you take a six year old and say, just go work 10 hours just on golf on the driving range. And they go, because we want you to become Tiger Woods. You know, I always say to them, I go, okay, who's the two best male Korean players of all time. Right. If you, if you really know the game of golf, you're going to probably come up with KJ Choi yeah. and a guy by the name of Y.E. Yang won a major. Mm -hmm. Right. And if you look at those two, I go, so we should probably copy what they did because they're the two most successful Korean golfers of all time. Both of them didn't play golf until they were 15 years old, hmm. right? One was a boxer, one was a power lifter, right? I'm like, that base of athleticism is what made them so great, right? right? If you look at the guys like Hideki Matsuyama from Japan, the guys that have tons of power, it's because they developed these along the way. They didn't just hit the ball straight 200 yards. 
they exploded 350 yards and hit the ball straight. And you just, it's just a different, it's a different mentality. And I think a lot of people feel like, well, no, I got to turn into a golfer first. Well, the best in the world were athletes first, and then they got into their sport. They usually don't specialize until like 14 or 15. But I think parents and kids think, oh, I got to specialize when I'm six. Sure. And that creates, Istvan has a, has a saying, he says, early ripe equals early rot. Mm. And that's just so true. In oh, that's well said. Yeah. You hear that story a lot in Major League Baseball pitching. It's every sport. Yeah. Every sport. It's unbelievable. I mean, yeah, if you, you know, people are like, oh, look at all the Tommy Johns. I mean, you know, all the, the, how often these surgeries are happening now. Well, before kids played five, six sports, right. now they just pitch all, all year. Right. Right. I mean, it's, or they're only throwing on a rubber or they're only throwing on a mound. Or, it's just you know, common it's, sense. Yeah. It's common right. sense. Like balance the body first, create those athletic skills. It's only going to be your advantage. Right. Mike Matheny, one of our buddies, he says that uh, the problem with baseball now is they only play baseball with uniforms on. Do you think that's a problem with golf too? Like, do you think there's not enough fun and joy in the game or is that not an issue with golf like it is in baseball? Especially with early specialization. If you take a kid, if you're a parent and you're like, I want my kid to be on the PGA Tour, if you are trying to make them focus on winning the U12 or let's say the win the 11-year-old championships, I promise everything you have to do to get them to win the 11-year-old championships hurts their chance of winning the Masters. Mm-hmm. Which is really, that, that you have to really think about that for a second. It's like everything you're doing to try and make them win the U13, you have to early specialize, get their golf skills, you have to cut back on some of the athletic development stuff, will hurt them from winning the Masters. Wow. That we can prove. Mm-hmm. Wow. I mean, that's insane. Yeah, and it's with every sport, right? So every sport, so I just feel like, you know, hey, let's do it. Let's do, let's copy bright spot training. Let's copy the bright spot. Let's copy what the best athletes do. I mean, name me a world number one that doesn't have this background that I'm talking about. It's hard for you to name that. Right. They all have it. Right. Like, we, you have to, surely you have to pay attention and go, wait a minute. Like the guys that just really specialize, they kind of break down. They kind of burn out. They're sick and tired. They're not doing it for them. They're doing it for their parents. Once they're old enough, they're like, screw that. I want to do something else. And it's just, it's hard to keep them in the sport. What sports do you think cross over well with golf? I always tell stories like if I've worked with like an NHL player, mm-hmm. they can always, it doesn't mean they're good at golf, but they can always, you know, I love, the, the I love hockey players. Ball. Obviously any rotary striking athlete, right? So from hockey to baseball are always, uh, field hockey for them are always great for transferring to golf, but also any distance control sports like basketball, like shooting free throws will help you with your short game. Mm. You know, any type of, uh, like, um, any controlling the face, uh, squash, racquetball. I mean, like a lot of our guys on PJ Tour are great table tennis players. Incredible table yeah, tennis same players. Same with baseball. Yeah, yeah, so just understanding the spin and controlling stuff about those things transfer really well into golf. So uh, we wanted to highlight uh, systems because you would, I mean, you can say, well, you just got to be good at what you're doing, but at the yeah, end of the day, you don't. Original, we can go back to your original question. I said luck, right? Yeah. Obviously, yeah. okay, I got lucky at the right time, but then you said, how did I get here? So I can kind of, uh, yeah, finish I, that. So I would yeah. tell you. So basically, all right, got lucky, started my practice in 1996, and uh, the the real story is, and this another falls into the luck bucket, uh, A one of the youngest ever top 100 coach in golf, his name was Dave Phillips at the time, uh, moved into Baltimore, Maryland, went to run a club called Kays Valley, which was maybe 35, 40 minutes from my facility. And uh, met Dave at previous talk that he was doing, great guy, and, and kind of built a relationship. And one day he calls me up and he's like, hey, I've got a really special client that uh, I take care of him and his son, and he's coming in next week, and I'd really like you to evaluate him. I want to get him on a fitness program. I'm like, how old is your son? And he's, how old is this player? And he's like, he's, he's just about turning 10. And I'm like, no problem. So he, that's all I know. Brings him into our facility, and I meet this young kid, Peter, and he's like, you know, I've been working with Peter for a couple of years. He's one of the best players in the Northeast, and would love for you to try and put him on a program, and his dad's there with him. And I show him, I take the kid through, like we were doing some really, my engineering background, I love the, the tech stuff, so we were doing some early 3D. I mean, back in the day... <laughs> My version of 3D is you'd hold a camera with one of the VCR tapes, you know, like oh, the yeah, camera, one yeah. of those, and you basically, you would film this little cube and we would digitize it. It would take two days to get one swing. I mean, this, but this was like state of the art type of stuff, right? So we go and we, we, uh, we do the 3D stuff. I do a physical screen on them. And after we're done, the dad is there with me and Dave. And he was like, I just got to say, because this is one of the coolest things I've ever seen in golf. And, and I, I just, I feel like this is the future and I'd love to support you. And I'm like... What does that mean? Like, what the hell do you do? Yeah. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, well, he goes, I think, what do you need? How can we help you? And I'm looking at David. I'm like, who is this guy? And he's like, Greg, that's the CEO of Titleist. And that's his son, Peter Uline. 
who's now on the PGA, or he's on the Live Tour now. But uh, so and Dave didn't tell you this. He just I got a great, I got a really important client. I want to come down and do it. So, oh man, so that's savage. So, yeah, so then they're they're driving away, and and, um, and Wally Uline, the CEO of Talos at the time, was like, "Hey, listen, uh, the way I see it is." Governing bodies, everything out there try have to limit how fast we can expand and grow. And he's like, but nobody can stop the human body from developing. He's like, we own the golf ball in Titleist. They have over 50% of the market. He goes, the average golfer loses five to six golf balls every time they play. He's like, if we can do anything to help expand the lifespan of a golfer, make them play more, we're in. This will help us. And he's like, get with Greg and see how I can help you. And that basically, when Dave called me, he was like, hey, they're serious. They want to do something here. And I'm like, well, what, what can we do? So I, I said... Uh, you know, I could start doing some some testing and some experimenting, like doing some of our physical screens and see, does it actually change distance and can it do some of these things? Next thing I know, like three weeks later, I get a bag of drivers from Tyler's. Like, here's some drivers for you to do your testing in. And then uh, Wally calls me and is like, I'd like to send three players down just to see, you know, have them go through the testing. And, you know, I saw what happened with my son, but I'd like to see with them. And he proceeds to send me Tom Kite, Peter Jacobson, and Brad Fax. <laughs> Those are the three test cases that came in, right? And Your tryouts with these three. Yeah, right. Three of the greatest guys ever, by the right. way. But so they come in. And Peter Jacobson actually got snowed in at my gym in D.C. No, with oh gosh. Guys, but what a great guy to get snowed in with. But um, And then basically what happened is two years later, he calls me and Dave, and he goes, you know, we've been experimenting, doing stuff with you guys. And he goes... Uh, uh, you know, most sports, as you know, like if you're working with the Cardinals, they, they spend money on taking care of their players, right? They have a development staff. He goes, we sponsor a ton of players. And we don't do anything. He goes, do you think we should? I'm like, well, yeah, you invest a lot of money. You should. And he's like, I'd like to show you a facility we have in California, and maybe you can help consult with us on what to build to take care of our players. So he flies Dave and I out here, and we see this place where you're sitting right now. And back then... Um, this was a place where we test clubs and Tylos did all their, like all the machine testing. And Dave and I were like, he was like, do you think this could be a great place to take our players? And we're like, yeah, this could be really <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I think it could maybe <laughs> work. Yeah. yeah. So we, we basically laid out a plan. We, we kind of designed like, here's what we would do if this is going to be a performance institute. And we gave it to him and Wally. And he was like, guys, I love this. I think this is great. He goes, I'll make you a deal. He goes, I'll build it if you guys come out and run it. And we were like, what? Like, it was like, and he's like, yep, I'll build it if you guys kind of run it. And I'm, I was like, twist my arm. Yeah. And uh, 2002, we moved, or end of 2002, started 2003, we moved out here. Facility was completed in 2003, and the rest is history. Wow. That is insane. Well, and then the crazy tie-in, too, is that I've heard you tell the story about is then the SFMA kind of rolled right off of that, too. So, so when, you know, okay, get to, let's talk business yeah. advice again. Yeah. Let's go back to business, right? So people always ask me, like, how do you, how do you build this, 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 this culture, I always call it, um, community of TBI. I always feel like one of the most important things you can do is surround yourself with people who are way smarter than you, right? Something I've been great at my entire career. Right? I'm like, all right, if I want to get into junior development, who are the smartest people in junior development? I want to feel like the idiot in the room. Let's get them on our board, see if they yeah. can help us, right? So when I got here, I'm like, all right, we're going to create an advisory board. We created one for coaching. We created one for like juniors. We created one for biomechanics. And we created one for medical. And one of the first people I put on that medical home was Mr. Greg Cook, yeah. right? which I know you guys know well. You've had the Greg Cook experience. That's right, right? yeah. So um, I, I brought Gray out because I'd met him. He started in 1996, too. He was in Virginia. I was in Maryland. Uh, I saw him doing early. Uh, actually, Gray, the great story about Gray is I saw him and Mike Voigt doing a, uh, a, a lecture in Baltimore, Maryland, and we became friends. And he said to me, he's like, I'm creating this movement screen, right? And I'm like, what do you mean? And he's like, uh, you know, you ever have this problem where you got athletes that come in and they're injured and you convince them that part of the problem that why they're injured is because they, they're lazy and they don't take care of themselves. So you convince them to go to the gym. He goes, so you fix them, you convince them to go to the gym and what do they do in the gym? They hurt themselves. Hurt themselves yeah. And he's like, you know, it pissed me off. He goes, I'm the one who convinced them to go in the gym and they did something stupid. He goes, so I'm coming up with a screen where, you know, I think if I do the screen right, I can kind of predict what movements they should stay away from. And I'll tell them, don't squat in the gym, don't lunge in the gym. That was the first thought. It's mm -hmm. turned into way more than right. that. Right? Sure, yeah. But it, it sparked an interest in me. And I was like, ah, that's kind of cool. I go, you know, I wonder if I can come up with a movement screen to predict why you swing the way you swing. Mm -hmm. Right. And literally, he was the first one that gave me the idea. And I was like. I bet you we could. And that's, that's when I started experimenting with screens. And that's the whole point of all of our screens was, was uh, you know, I don't, it, screening doesn't tell me if you're going to get injured. It doesn't tell me how high level you can get. People think it's for talent identification. They get it's never was for any of that stuff, right? To me, all it does is it helps me understand why you swing the way you swing or why you move the way you move. But that's pretty important. 
You know, if you see somebody swinging weird, you might go, I wonder if they just need a lesson or is that their body? Well, the movement screen can tell you right away if that's right. physical right. Or, or if it's technical. So, so when we created this advisory board for, for medical, I looked at Gray and I go, you know, we, you've got the, your FMS. I said, we've got our little golf screen now. I go, we need one for injury. Mm. I go, because you, you and I both know, like if they're injured, it can alter their movement screen. And it has nothing to do with the movement screen. They're just injured. And he's like, well, I've been working on something. And I always tell this story, like, to me, he's like, Tom, he's like, uh, Henry Ford, yeah. right? He's like, hey, dude, I've been working on this thing. It's called a car. And I'm, like, <laughs> right. I'm like, what's a car? And he's like, hey, let's go for a ride. Come over here. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah we, go, sure. we go get in the car and we start going. And for me, great. I'm like, this is so cool. And all of a sudden the tires fall off. and blow. I'm like, okay, this is a really cool idea. I'm not sure how good your car is, but that was really <laughs> yeah, cool. Right? Really awesome. So I said, I said, hey, you know what? I go, my brain, his systems, engineering, I go, I bet you I can help you create an assembly line to make these not break down. I go, I'd like to help you complete this and develop this. And he's like, let's do it. So we created this thing called the SFMA. We got a couple other guys like Mike Boyd, Kyle Kiesel, a couple of people, and to do the research and testing. And uh, basically in 2008 or 9, um, SFMA, we launched it under Titleist. So once we got done, we were like, we'll launch it under medical. And we were like, this can't just be a golf medical thing. This is for everybody. So we started doing it everywhere. And I was like, you know what? This really belongs under the FMS umbrella. So we actually merged. SFMA merged with FMS. And that's how it became one of the owners of FMS now, too. That is so awesome. Yeah, what, what a small world. Yeah. So then uh, fast forward to now, you've got a, you've got people all over this facility. You've got golfers coming from all over. You're working on having baseball players come in from all over yep. and stuff like that. How do you, uh, how did you start to kind of place the people in the roles that are making them successful? And, and, uh, it, well, yeah. First, first of all, I was, people are always like, man, I can't believe how great TPI is. When people say TPI, there's 27,000, well, there's over 27,000 certified TPI professionals now in, in 64 countries around the world, right? So I think you might say, oh, well, what about the employees here? I'm thinking the 27,000 people around the world, because that that's our army, right? That's when people say TPI, they're talking about them. They didn't come here. They're, they're going to see those people. So I always say, like, in business, you want to you wanna create that culture. You want to create that community. And, and it's really, there's, there's some really key things that are important on doing something like that. Like, number one, you, you've got to have their interests, number one. Period. Like if, if you're like, I'm trying to figure out how to make my business better. You're not going to, you're not going to succeed. You've got to figure out how to make their businesses better. Right. You know what I mean? Like that's our mission here is how do we, you know, obviously we have the biggest team in sports, right? Baseball teams have 250 to 300 players, you know, the basketball team way less. When I got here to golf, I was like, this is going to be great. There can't be that many players. And then <laughs> Tyler goes, okay, we sponsor 8,000 players. I'm like, wait, what? I mean, we have, we have the biggest team in sports, right? So when you have these, these big, big networks like that, you can't do it. You have to create this, this uh, community. Culture, of, culture of education, yeah. people doing it. So, you know, one of the things uh, we did is we said, all right, uh, I can't take care of 8,000 players. I go, but I sure as hell, I think, can educate a, a group of warriors that we take the information we're learning from the best players in the world and pass it on to them. So they know how to attack these players and we'll tell our players to go see these guys and, and guys and gals all over the world and let's see if it works. And uh, here we are right. with uh, 27,000 of them. Now, if you're sponsored by Titleist, do you automatically get all access to all the services that you're providing? We don't like to say this publicly, but yes, <laughs> it's part of their contract. A lot of them don't know that or else we can't handle it. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, no. So you're going to have to rush them. Yeah. The, no, the, you've been the, charging them. It's a problem. Yeah. <laughs> the key to the door here is the golf ball. So if you play the golf ball, you can come here. Um, with that said, you know, we take care of guys like John Rum and Phil Mickelson, guys that don't, aren't even Titleist. So we do charge non Titleist players. They do it but if you're a Tyler sponsored player how we pay you yeah. yeah we're part of your part of your deal well we always talk about too you know you, you kind of run into uh, a dichotomy of you have two choices right you can either sit here and hold all the information in and say no no no, no. I am this is the place or that's you, not how you build right a, uh, or you go into education where yeah. you basically say no I'm going to take these I'm going to show the world yeah. when I first started my practice in 1996 I when I went to this is a funny story so I go to I, I, I'm leaving Palmer and I know that I want to open up a golf practice. And I was like, you know, I think it'd be easier just to buy an existing practice. It might be easier. And I saw a couple of practices for sale. So I walked into this one practice and it was called White Flint Chiropractic. And it's the, in the ad, it said it was for sale. So I walk in there and I walk in the front desk and I go, is this, I go, is, is, is the owner here? And the woman there in front is like, sure, let me go get him. Can I give him your name? And I'm like, my name is Greg Rose. I'm a, a new student. I'm just looking at practices. 
And she's like, okay. And she goes, gets him. She gave me a weird look. Comes back, and this guy, Bob Ripkin, Rifkin, his name comes out. Bob was awesome. He came out, and he was, he was like, can I help you? And I was like, hey, yeah, I, just, I saw that your practice is for sale, and I'm, I'm interested. And he goes, he looks at her, and she looks at me. He goes, is our practice for sale? And I, and I go, is this white <laughs> plate chiropractic? He goes, no, it's not. And I'm like, oh, my bad. <laughs> Sorry. And he's like, well, hold on. He goes, he goes so, so tell me about you. And I go, I, go, I'm a, I just graduated. I'm looking. He's like, I'm looking for an associate. This is a true story. And he was like, if it doesn't work out and you can't find somebody, he goes, please come back here. He goes, he goes I'd love to talk to you about our practice. So I, I went and I looked at a couple of places and I started thinking about it. I was like, you know what? It'd probably be good to pick the brain of somebody who's been in practice for a long time, learn some of these insurance stuff and all that stuff. So I called him and I was like, hey, Bob, I, I, you know, I met you earlier. I go, I'm interested. I go, I just want you to know that I'm a weird dude. I go, I'm, I want to work on just athletes. I'm going to focus on golf. And he was like, kid, I don't care whatever you want to do because I just need help. It'd be great. You can use whatever you want. So... I went in there and I worked with him for six months and it was great. It was what a great experience just to get the mentorship, which I think a lot of people are missing nowadays, right? And after six months, I was like, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm expanding. I need to open up a facility where I can do golf stuff. And, and he didn't want me to go, but I was like, I'm, I'm going to go. And, but I was like, hey, I'd love to keep picking your brain. And he was such a great mentor. And I remember I opened my practice and I started getting some really good traction. It was really exploding. And I was like, you know what? I think I want to do seminars. I think I want to educate other people. And I was like, but I don't know. Like, do I want to give away like my secret sauce, right? Like you were saying. And uh, so I called him. I'm like, hey, Bob, I got to take you to dinner. So I think dinner and I sit down because he used to do lectures in like uh, uh, yoga and some other stuff. And I go, I'm thinking of doing seminars on my golf stuff. And he's like, oh man, that'd be awesome. You should do it. You love that stuff. And I was like, but I'm worried. I'm like, you know, if I, if I show everybody what I'm doing and he looked at me, he goes, are you serious right now? He goes, he goes, if I was bigger than you, I'd slap you right now. I go, what do you mean? He goes, listen, if you're better at something than anybody else and you have more knowledge than anybody else, he goes, you need to tell the world what you're doing or somebody's going to copy you and they're going to think they did it. He goes, stop worrying about that crap. Everything will work out. Just go do your seminar. I'm like, yes, sir. That's what I started doing my seminars. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> that is, uh, great advice to you. Holy smokes. So what do you think, uh, where would Greg Rose be right now without Titleist? Let's just say the Titleist hadn't like fallen into your lap, kind of like it Dude, did. And if you asked me like in, in 1990 or in 2000, even if you said, hey, would you be lecturing in 10 languages in 22 countries? No chance, dude, no chance. So, you know, one of the things about a community or creating a culture is, is credibility. Right. You know, like I always said, like when a golfer walks into a gym and says, I want to work with a trainer, you know, in the past, the trainer had to used to convince the golfer that training was important. You don't have to do that anymore. We've taken care of that. Now they just want to make sure that the trainer knows what they're doing. So when a trainer comes up to him and goes, hey, I heard you're looking for some golf training, the golfer is going, what does this guy know about golf? If he can go, oh, no, I'm Tyler certified. Don't worry about it. It's, that's credibility. It's a big deal. Mm -hmm. It gave the credibility and it gave access to the best players in the world for us to actually get the right information so that we're not making anything up. I mean, it was everything. Right. Everything. How many barriers did you run into being a chiropractor? Or did you not have any? Did it help you, or what would? How I would say, I hate to say this, but most of the people didn't even know what the hell I was. Yeah, and I don't think it mattered. In in sports, in my opinion, you tell me if you guys think any different. Athletes don't give a shit. Just can you help? Yeah, me? Yeah, exactly. You can make me better. I don't care what's your degree. For sure. Right. Right. And I, honestly, you know, I was we in our lectures and our seminars, we have pretty pretty big community of physical therapists and chiropractors, and you know the whole. Uh, debate over physical chiropractic. My, my statement on this has always been the same. If I walk into your office and I can tell what you are, if I can tell you're a chiropractor, or I can tell you're a physical therapist, you have a major gap in your knowledge. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's, I'm just yeah, saying like yeah. the best of the best do it all. Like we would gray cook used to, comes here and we would treat clients. Hey, I have no idea what he is. They have no idea. He's a physical therapist. Not a chiropractor. We do the same thing. Right. Right. If you can't, it's kind of obvious. I know there's a gap in your knowledge. Right. Right, that's that, how I feel. Yeah, the top ten yeah. percent of all yeah. those, even ATCs that you can add in that category, they're all probably doing similar I mean, things. They all have the similar skills. Uh, YouTube, you can learn anything. <laughs> like, yeah, the only thing limiting you is you, right? So if you're like, oh, well, they didn't teach me that in school, I'm like, you think they taught me that in school too? Right. Like that, yeah. that's that's not an excuse anymore. And then how did you like begin to even think about how to package TPI? Like, what did you study? What I mean, what did that all look like? I mean, that gives me anxiety for you thinking Actually, about how you you want the secret sauce. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm telling you, this is, this is our secret sauce, our secret sauce. And I don't know, I'm trying to think how I came up with this first thing, but it was, I actually, I think I do know. I, I was doing seminars for coaches and we, I love philosophy. I hate debates. Mm. Okay. So if I say to you, you know, our philosophy is 
But we don't think there's one way to swing. We think there's a million ways to swing, but we do think there's one efficient way for you to swing, and it's based on what you can physically do. So, like, if your arm doesn't work one way, we'll teach you a different way. We, that's our philosophy. But if you say, no, 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 everybody swing, your forearm's got to be vertical over here. Okay, that's a debate now. Right now everybody's going to, because some coaches are going to be like, I don't teach that, and right. I don't like debates. I like philosophies that everybody can go, okay, I can see that. When you're with coaches, I mean, you baseball background, imagine if I took, 12 pitching coaches from 12 different teams. And I said, all right, guys, here's how you pitch. How's this conversation going to go? Yeah. Okay, There's going to be chairs thrown. I'm dead on arrival <laughs> yeah, already, tough. right? Yeah. So what I said right away is I was like, let's not, like, if you come to our TPI program, we absolutely do not teach you how to swing a golf club. Right? If you come to our on-base program, we do not teach you how to throw a baseball. What we do, which I think is very unique in our special sauce, is we go, can we all agree on what you shouldn't do? Because mm. that's way easier. Sure. So if I take 12 pitching coaches and I go, can we all agree when you land on your front leg, you shouldn't keep flexing and collapse all the way through? And every one of them's going to go, yeah, I agree with those. And we went, we started all of our programs in golf first. As we went through and I go, okay, if I say this to 100 coaches, would any of them argue? Mm -hmm. And we finally got to the point where I'm like, I got down to 12 things that not one golf coach I ever met was like, yeah, no, that's crazy. They're all like, yeah, I agree. You should never do that. So in our programs, what we do is we go, all right, I'm going to teach you a physical screen to be able to identify what's probably the path of least resistance, the easiest way for this person to swing. And then I'm going to teach you probably the most common characteristics that if a player does, it usually creates some efficiency problems. Right. Right. So like swaying in golf. So if you're, you're moving too far laterally, right? So we teach you these, these characteristics of what we all agree you shouldn't do, right? And we say, if you sway, it can create these problems. And here's some of the physical movements that could make you have to sway. But if you said to me, well, how do I do a backswing and not sway? I go, oh, there's a million ways to do that. I don't know. That's up to you. That's up to you and your coach. You know what I mean? Like, we don't tell you <laughs> how. It's kind of like a bailout. It yeah. It's yeah. a bailout. It's more yeah. it of No, but it, uh, to me, that's because there is a million ways. Like, sure. if you ask me, what's the best way to load your back hip? I'm like, how many ways do you want? Right. Greg, if you have an average 10-year-old athlete. Yeah. And they move here to San Diego and they're, you're working with them all the time with your wonderful team here. Mm -hmm. What's possible with that athlete if they have the exact right environment around them? Because we all know the greats. I mean, like they're, they're great from the time they pop out of the room. I mean, I have a video of uh, Tiger Woods swinging a golf club when he's two years old on the Johnny Carson show that is like majestic how yeah. good it is. Yeah. So let what's me, let possible? Let me tell you how I answer this. So, um, Okay. I'm gonna. I'm just gonna be a long answer, but let me. Let, let's say on, if baby. if I said uh, to you, uh, you know muscles. You have fast twitch and slow twitch muscles, right? Fast twitch muscles are the ones that are explosive, and slow twitch ones are the ones that maintain posture. If you want to be a really powerful athlete, you want as much fast twitch. You want to be explosive fast. It's fast twitch. Now there's a genetic component to fast twitch, right? So when you're born, if I take a biopsy and let's say you have 20% fast twitch, and they take my biopsy and I have 30%. Are you screwed for the rest of the, if we're competing against each other, will I always be more explosive? Or can we change your genetics? We can't change your genetics. Or not your I'm, genetics. Could we change your percentage fast twitch? If you were genetic, genetically you were born with 20%, I was born with 30%. Can you change fast twitch? Can I influence and make more yes. muscle? The answer is yes. We used, we, we used to not be sure about that, if you can do that. But we now know we can influence the amount, percent of fast twitch to slow twitch by the way you train. Okay? If you train smart... I could probably, if you were at 20, I could probably get you maybe to 35 and get you more than mine. What if I train smart? I'll always have more than you. Right. If I train smart, right? So here's the thing. If you take a 10-year-old and I give you all the right training and do everything right, I absolutely can give you the best chance of, of becoming the next Tiger Woods. But if you don't have the genetics behind you, someone who has the genetics and does all the training will still be probably beat you. Right. right. So there's a, I don't want to say like, Hey, if you just pluck somebody out, anybody can be a PGA tour because that's total crap. Right. Right. There, there, there is some, uh, parental genetics that's important here. Right. So, but I would tell you like, it's amazing how much good training can do though. Mm -hmm. Right now the mental, I, I, I always say I can give you the skills of a PGA tour player. I think that's, I don't want to say it's easy, but I know the formula to do that. The brain, now that's another animal. Right. Right. So, I mean, how many great players are great until they get out there under the lights and the pressure, million dollar putt, and all of a sudden you're like, who is that person? That's not the person. Or some people are like, they live for that and they just get better. That's what PGA, LPGA tour players do. Well, now, like the, the 
we we're talking this the Netflix series Full Swing dropped literally this week, and so it, it really I, I've I've been binging it obviously, so it really kind of shadows exactly what you're talking about. So yeah. you can have the best players in the world, but if you don't make the putt on 18 to win the tournament, you don't win. You know, so th- how how are we having an influence on that I had, TPI and that kind of thing? I had a uh, this is a story I won't name any names, but I had a player that was struggling that was here with a player that was one of the top five in the world, and the guy who was top five in the world was waiting for me to finish. And the last part of this that we're in the gym here. And he was eavesdropping to my conversation. The guy's like, you know, he goes, I, I had an opportunity last week. I got into the, like the, the second to last group. And he goes, man, he goes, I was so nervous. He goes, I just, it just fell apart. I choked. And I'm like, dude, this happens to everybody. I'm like, you just got to get used to that stuff. And he's like, yeah, I don't know. I guess I just, I, I feel so, feel so uncomfortable in that type of thing. And I'm like trying to explain to him, this is totally normal. You just, unfortunately, I mean, Patrick Harrington told me I lost 29, came in second 29 times before he won. I'm like, it's just, that's, that's going to happen. That player leaves. The guy, the top five guy comes over to me. He's like, dude, I couldn't help but over here. And he goes, he goes, that was torture to listen to that. I go, I go, what do you mean? He goes, he goes, dude, I live for that feeling. He goes, if I don't have that feeling, I feel like I don't even want to be here because I have no chance to win. He goes, when I get that feeling, something good's happening. And he goes, that's what I live for. He goes, I couldn't imagine being afraid of that. And I'm like, well, that's why you're who are you are. Yeah, that's yeah, it's like nice. an adrenaline rush. And that's it. Yeah. Can, can, we, yeah. can you have an influence on that? I don't want to call it a skill, but you can by getting them in those situations early. So they experience it. I think once like people stage fright, you know, if you've never been on stage before, it's scary. If it's your hundredth time doing that, it's like, you know, this is cool. I'm looking for it. What about, uh, what about Greg Rose? When was your moment that you started to kind of feel that with this whole situation in TPI? And, and, uh, do, do you remember a moment when you're like, Oh God, like this is actually exploding. Like this is going to happen. This is going to, you know what I mean? Like that turning point, point where you, yeah, the tipping point where everything kind of started to roll. Yeah. Honestly, it was, uh, when I got that phone call from Wally going, uh, Hey, we, we want to potentially open up a test facility. And I was like, man, if we could get that, that name, that credibility behind us. I'm like, that could be huge. So I, I remember that vividly. And then, uh, I mean, honestly, one of the first things where I was like, man, I'm really proud of where I was more the, probably the first World Golf Fitness Summit. You mentioned that. That's been something we do every two years. It's been really, really cool. And uh, um, just to see, like I said, when you look out and you're like, man, we got five continents here with people. And I'm like, I just never would imagine that. Sure. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, we've had uh, Gervais on our podcast, and I saw him for the first time at that. He did. He did. He did oh, gosh. It was so motivating. I thought he did an unbelievable awesome. job. Yeah. And then, uh, I'll you tell guys you guys had him on here yet? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. We, uh, I took a player out to him one time and we were in, uh, we were in Hermosa beach. And, um, so he was trying to make the player feel like stress, you know? So he's like asking a player all these questions. He's like, you know, do you want to go skydiving? Do you want to go surfing? And the player was like, no, you know, I could have done all that. So he's like, uh, he's like, I'll tell you what we're going to do. Well, the guy's like, you know, the one thing that would get me really nervous is public speaking. Cause he wasn't, um, he wasn't from the United States. And so he ends up making this player go up to like random women at this coffee shop and give them an unsolicited compliment. Yeah. And this guy was like a really straight, morally great guy. And so like, and he had a girlfriend. So, I mean, this was like, it was like, oh gosh, it was, you know, it was insane to watch. But, um, so then once the, the player would feel all the rush of feelings and he would talk him through like, you know, how to handle that. But that's it, what I love Mike. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It's but, so hard simulating game like activity being like, how do you get a pitcher in that situation where it's all on the line? How do you get a golfer to feel what it feels like to be in the middle of the fairway on 18 at Augusta with a one stroke lead? I'm sorry, you can't, right. like, you have to experience it. Or like ACT testing, you know, some people, you know, they'll do way better on their pre test than they do on the day of the test and other people will. Yeah. Yeah. I say pressure makes diamonds, but also hemorrhoids. Yeah. So <laughs> that's a classic Brett Winchester joke there. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. But I mean, so, I mean, you basically walked us through what this place is going to look like in two years from now. Is there going to be like a mental health? So we've been actually, we've been working on a, a brain science class one on, and it's, it, it's amazing. The whole, that world is still like the wild, wild west. It's the, oh, everyone, know. you know, like EEGs and all that. I think people are still learning on that stuff because I don't think anybody really knows how the human brain really works. Um, but I, 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 Formula One has a, has a test center in Italy where they do a lot of the mental management type of stuff that we've kind of looked at some of those things. And there's some great, obviously, mental coaches here. Um, 
I, I do believe it's the separator. I mean, it's, it's, mm -hmm. we have so many, we have so many great players on the mini tours. The greatest minds are on the PGA tour and the LPGA tour. Right. I mean, it's just, well, you know it too, because you look at a Monday qualifier and you got guys shooting 58, 59, 60, you know, and then they get on the PGA tour and they're shooting. It's, 80. you know, it's when you're the best in your local region and you, you get this, you get this chip on your shoulder, you're the best. And then when all of a sudden you get somewhere and you're like, Oh, I'm just one of a hundred. Like we're all the same. We can all. Just, how do you separate yourself mm -hmm. from those? You right. Know I mean? It's like the the swing is just one little piece. What do you think about? Uh, I've had this conversation a lot with uh, Stu McGill, and because he's also an engineer, and engineers by trait, they're very good at critical thinking. Mm -hmm. So problem solving things like that. How much do you think your engineering background has helped you? My, my engineering background, I think, engineering just teaches you how to think. Right, so that, that's a little like difference between engineering school and chiropractic school. Like when I went to engineering school, it was like, okay, you're going to build. We're going we're to spend a semester learning on how to build roofs, and so that they won't fall down. Right, and the final, they go and they go, okay, you got to go build a roof, but you're in Antarctica, and there's going to be fifty, you know, five hundred feet of snow on top of your roof, and you're like, well, we never talked about snow loads. They're like. We know you don't know how to figure this out. We just want to see how you would try and go about it. So you have to write down your like, all right, well, the first thing I would do is I would, because it's like, you're like, there's no right, like, I know there's the right answer, but I don't know. <laughs> it. So I just got to try and prove to them that the way I think would be good. And I'm like, that's weird, right? When I went to chiropractic school, it was like anatomy. And it was like, okay, what artery does, and I'm like, where's the trick? And I'm like, I just have to memorize it. Just write, I'm, like, <laughs> yeah. I'm like, this is so easy. I'm like, this is simple. Exactly so, right. so, so, uh, engineering was, was much more like, like I said, like Gray's car, like the SFMA. I'm like, you know, if you guys are familiar with SFMA, the flow charts, mm -hmm. obviously I'm the jerk who did the flow charts. There's the system. I go through and I go, if I put the flow chart together, we can see if there's any breaks in the flow chart type of stuff. So I feel like that's important in your business and any business is to create those systems so that, you know, number one, if it works and the, final product, the exact product you want, but it's also so you can teach other people to do it so that you can go do something else and the process still runs. And how do you reconcile the thought where you have a system, but you also are not trying to have like a cookie cutter approach well, to the something? the system needs to be random. So uh, you put a random thing in there and it goes through and depending on what that person is, okay, first check this, then check this. And, and it's an if thens. If this, this, you go this way. And that, that way it is a system, but everybody ends up in a different bucket based on where they end up. Right. At least that's how my mind. So the variable is the in rather than the system. Yeah. I mean, the, to me, the variable is always the athlete. Sure. Right. So every athlete comes in with a different problem. You know, I hate it when I, when someone comes in and I go, oh, I can tell who your coach is or I can tell because you're doing the same thing they tell everybody. That's just a bad coach. Right. 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 Like we have one of our level instructors, Mark Blackburn. Mm -hmm. Mark Blackburn was you know, one coach of the year two years ago, one of the best coaches. The thing I love about Mark is if I look at his players, and they are all different. <laughs> they really are. They are so different, right? If you look at a, a Max Homa versus a, even a Charlie Hoffman, or just you just go down the list. Now Justin Rose, different ones. I'm like, nobody swings the same way. Nobody does something. And he, as a coach, has he's adapted to that that animal right. and said, hey, we're going to coach you that way. Right. That's that's what the best do. Right. But he has a system. I can tell you for sure he's got a system. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so you've been around some of the great coaches. What are, you know, what are some of the traits that they use besides simplicity? And like, what are the, what are the great coaches doing that the rest are not? I'm assuming yeah. it's not in-depth biomechanical talks. So, man, I can talk about this for a long time. So um, to me, okay, first and foremost, you, you got to be able to identify the problem quick, Right. I, like whether you're a technical, whether you're more of a, you know, field type, it doesn't matter if you're not working on the right thing, you're going to suck. Right. Okay. So you've got to diagnostics is there. If you look at Butch Harmon, Butch Harmon is one of my favorite coaches in the world. And, uh, as about as low tech as it comes, knows all the tech, right. Can use it all I want, but his eyes are so good. He like, when he's like, here's the problem. And we go through all our testing. I'm like, Butch was right. <laughs> like, yeah. so it's just, they just, they're, they know the problem. And they, they're now, once you know the problem, okay, now a great coach has 800 different ways of fixing that problem. Mm -hmm. Not one. Like if you're like, oh, I've got, I teach this. I have, I use this one style. Like in chiropractic, you know, we've got how many techniques we've got, <laughs> right? So we've got a million techniques. How many techniques do you know how to do? I mean, you have a million tools yeah. in your toolkit, right? I, I don't understand people who are like, I just do this. And I'm like, okay, well, then that's only going to work for, you know, yeah. one eighth Limiting. of the, or whatever. So, so I feel like great coaches know tons of different styles, different, different techniques, because you never know which one's going to apply to which person, right? And then to me, okay, that's just first and foremost, that's technical from a coach. But coaching is different than swing instruction. That's swing instruction. You know, coaching to me is, is number one, listening. Not, they don't talk as much. The best coaches, they listen, absorb a lot of stuff. They pay attention. And then basically 
helping steer the player to work on what they really need to work on, not what they think they need to work on. Yeah, so what do you think about, you know, there's so much technology in golf. There's so yeah. much technology in baseball right now. Yeah. And there's almost like in a way, I feel like the pendulum has now swung off of that a little bit. Well, <laughs> remember, I'm one of the jerks who brought a lot of that technology in there. But I, <laughs> so I can tell you. So here's let's talk the problem with baseball real quick. Right. So and I've told this story a couple times is like I was I was. Uh, I, brought, I was brought into China to work on uh, doing some consulting with the COC, with the Chinese Olympic Committee over there. And the table tennis group asked me to, to help them do some stuff. I said, I don't know anything about table tennis, right? And I was very upfront. I'm like, dude, if you bring bring them in there, first of all, I'm going to call it ping pong. And number two is like, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know anything about it. And they were like, it's no problem. Can we drink? <laughs> yeah, can we drink? Can we drink? So they're, they're, they come in and they were like, you know, and this is what all great organizations do. I can talk about from the soccer side to table tennis. They'll come in and they'll go, all right, listen, here's a bunch of great coaches. And they go, here are the 10 things that are the most important for us as coaches to know. To us sports science geeks, they'll say, could you help us measure these 10 things? And then we go away and we come back and we go, okay, you asked for 10. Here's some tools. We got you eight of them. And they're like, dude, you're awesome. This is great. Blah, blah, blah. We love you. Here's baseball. Okay, so baseball heard that these data science guys, these tech guys are really important. So they go hire them. And what do they say to them? They go, so what should we measure? And the data science goes, you asking me? Like, <laughs> right. I don't know anything about table tennis. What are you talking? You're asking me what to measure? And I'm like, dude, you're supposed to tell me. Sure. Right. So what happened is it's like the, the tail's wagging the dog, right? So the data science person wants to keep their job. So, and it's, a lot of this is changing, but this is what originally happened is the data science came from Australian rules football or some, somewhere where they got them. They know that sport. And they go, well, I don't know, work for that sport. You should look at this. And they give these reports and they do all this stuff at spring training. They gather all this data and they give it to the coaches. And the coaches are like, what the hell is this? Never even seen this before. And like, does this matter? And all of a sudden they're trying to, they're trying to argue whether this matters. And I'm like, where did you get this? Right? And I'm like, this came from a sports science person. And I'm like, why, why are they building your dashboard? If you're the Formula One driver, you tell me, you tell the mechanic what you want on your dashboard. The mechanic doesn't tell you what's on your dashboard. You tell them what's on the dashboard. So I think what's happened is a lot of the coaches are like, screw that stuff. We're out of that. It doesn't make any sense. I'm like, I agree with you. The stuff you were looking at doesn't make any sense. But if you actually asked us what you think is important and we put our data science behind that, you'd think data science is the best thing ever. Sure. Right. So then it's, a, it's wrong application yeah, of, of incredible fair, things. Yeah. So then uh, how do you then, uh, I assume you have a, you know, you have a player, a high level player coming in here, right? Are they expecting to have those fancy readouts and stuff like that? How much are you relying on the data players, versus the players have no, players have no idea what the technology you're going to use. All they've heard is that, man, that place is awesome. They're going to help you. Sure. Right. And I, I always tell coaches this too, all of this tech, like whether you have our force plates, if you have 3d motion capture, if you have Kanga tech strength, whatever you have, right. All of that in my mind is not for the athletes, for the coach to do with the first thing I told you, what's the most important thing for a coach diagnose the problem, sure. right. To make sure you're working on the right thing. So I, what's the MRI for? Is it for the patient or the doctor? It's for the doctor. I mean, imagine if you went to the doctor, they take an MRI and they go, here you go. And they hand you an MRI. You'd be like, uh, <laughs> what, is that a tumor? Like what else is it, right? And that's what's happening is people are getting these reports. They're going on Google, right? And they're, or chat, whatever they're going, and they're going to go look to see, yeah, they're going to go look to see what does this squiggly line mean? And I'm just going, how did you get that? That's actually an MRI. It was for your doctor. Your doctor is supposed to tell you. And we've gone so from somebody who is deeply entrenched in this stuff that's not how it was intended. So if you have a coach or let's say you have a chiropractor that wants to do where you're... It's for them. Where you started. Yeah. So yeah. like where, what would be the questions, I guess, that number one, they should be asking? And then number two, what would the tech be to answer those kind of baseline initial yeah. okay. questions? So in a medical practice, like sure. what tech? Yeah. Have tech? So I, I feel like number one, medical are trained to look at x-rays, MRIs. They're used to looking at lab reports, sure. type of stuff, right? So... I think this isn't so far fetched from the medical world. The, the basic things I think that most medical practitioners can do is usually you can find a space in your office somewhere where you can actually film the athlete doing their motion, mm -hmm. right? Whether it's hitting a hockey puck or hitting a golf club, put a little net that pops up. And people are like, well, that's the coach's job. No, it's not. Okay. They've hired you. It's like, would you ever take your car to a mechanic who didn't know how to drive? I mean, it's kind of laughable. <laughs> yeah. Like you would be like, like, what are you talking about? Why would I take a, like, of course you need to, if I'm taking you to a chiropractor who specializes in gymnastics, you better know something about gymnastics or else you're not a, a, a gymnastic expert. You're just a chiropractor who's pretending to go after gymnastics, right? right? So if you're going to go after, if you're going to be a baseball chiropractor, right? I expect you should be able to film them pitch and film them hit just so that when the coach sends them in or if they come in and they say, we're working on this, 
first of all, I want you to see it. So you can see it so it, your brain starts to think of different parts of the body that can cause this, right? And I also think it's important for you to understand that this is the goal, right? The goal is not to hear a pop or click. The goal is not for them to say, I feel better. The goal is for that to change, mm -hmm. right? And if that doesn't change, you didn't do your job. Right, because that's that's why they came here. They they came in because the front tire was wobbling, right? And if, and if the front tire is still wobbling, I don't care how much polish you put on the car. The front tire is still wobbling. It right. doesn't matter. That's why they came in, right? So I think it's very important. So number one, video. Right? What's the best video camera on the planet right now? The iPhone. Right. I mean, you don't have to. It's 240 frames. It's it's great. Um, even though I said that, but uh, I just got the Huawei P40 Pro. It's the the Chinese phone that's. Well, if you have a SIM card, I don't think it's legal. But if you don't have a SIM card, it's legal. Legal, right? yeah. Okay, so it's the Huawei P40 Pro. It can go up to 7,600 frames per second. It's like faster than Edgetronics. It's the coolest thing ever. Okay, so that, that's it's like 899 bucks. Um, cheap compared for cheap. that. I mean, I mean like it's that. like a care. It's unbelievable. Um, but iPhone. Okay, iPhone to 40 frames. Then the next technology that I would I would bring in is I always say there's as a chiropractor, as a coach, or as a fitness professional. If you're going to work with athletes, there's three things you need to know. You need to know what they're doing. You need to know how they're doing it. And you need to know why they're doing it, if you want to help them, right? There's the what, the why, and the how. All three of those are different technologies, right? right? If I want to know what a player is doing, video can tell me that. 3D motion gaps, there's like K-Vest and 4D, these little sensors you can put on them. It gives you way more information on what they're doing, right? I think having that is important. And again, the basic is a video camera. That's what. Okay, now if you want to know how they're doing it, in other words, right now I can see what you're doing. You're swaying. You're moving to the right, right? If I want to know how you're moving to the right, there's 50 different ways to move to the right. That's a force plate, mm -hmm. right? So looking at your ground reaction forces, how you push against the ground kind of helps me understand. If you want to step into your player and feel what they feel, that's how. That's force plates, right? So force plate would be the next thing. But now if you want to, all of those, force plates, 3D, 2D, it doesn't tell you why they're doing this at all. It just tells you what they're doing. People are always like, hey, I saw their 3D report. Can you tell me what to work on? I go, no. And they're like, well, you have the 3D. I'm like, I know. I can see what you're doing. I just don't know why you're doing it. Right. Right? I need to know why you're doing it. If I want to know why you're doing it, well, now I need to know physical. Right? There's where the movement screening comes in. I want to know mentally. Like, what do you think you're supposed to do? Like, all those things are important on the why. And I think you need to have all three of those before you open your mouth. Right? And so I think as a diagnostician, Whatever tools can help you get the what, the why, and the how are always beneficial. Right, Trey. Yeah. What do you think about, uh, obviously in baseball, we have an epidemic problem with the Tommy John surgery and the UCL rupture. What are you guys finding with your technology with, with that injury? What are some of the trends that you're noticing? And yeah. uh, what's the, let's do it this way. If it was a pie chart, how do you think that pie chart would break out? Meaning, do you think 80% is biomechanics? 20% is you're pitching too much. Uh, you know, well, how would that all break out, do you think? Oh, man. Okay. Well, I would say, um, but the pie chart, I got to think about what percentage I put in there. But um, the big bucket. Let's, 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 let's just do biomechanics. Let's just do biomechanics. Well, let's go to the big buckets. Okay. Let's, go, let's go over the big bucket causes of this. All right. All right. We already mentioned one. Athlete first. Right. Early specialization. All you do is throw and pitch. You don't play other sports. Okay. That's proven recipe for disaster, right? right. Things are going to wear out. Right. So if that's what you're doing with your kid and all they do is throw and all they do is play baseball or anything else, your chances are going up X percent. Right. Okay. So that, that's what percent of that pie chart. It's a big one. Okay. That one. Right. Uh, number two, uh, you know, I, I've, if you hit a wall in a car, let's say you're driving a car and you hit a wall going 20 miles an hour, Versus hitting it going 100 miles an hour, what's going to do more damage? Yeah, you'd rather be going 20. I'm sorry, like if you don't throw 95 right now, you're slow. Mm -hmm. Like back in the day, like how many? Yeah, people, that was you were the ace if you. <laughs> yeah. I had a 16 year old here throwing 101 the other day. I'm like, I'm like, what is going? So, so I'm sorry, athletes are just moving way faster now, so we're going to get more damage, right? right. So the, the 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 need for speed, putting it on there, which I get it, it pays. Uh, adds to the injury in incidents. There's just no way it can't, right? So uh, early specialization, fast as you can. Can I say social media, internet? Can we, can we, yeah. this is probably 80, 80% of the, of the problem, <laughs> yeah, right? Exactly. So it, which, which feeds actually. the two things we just talked about, right? So literally when you go online and you see, you know, someone going, hey, I did those weighted balls to make me throw it faster. You go, the key's weighted balls, mm -hmm. right? But if you actually went to drive line and saw Kyle Bodie and his team, or if you went to NPA and saw Tom House and her team, the first two years they're going to do is build the foundation of strength to, to put the speed on top of. They're not just going to put speed on top of crap, but that's all you saw on social media. So parents just give 
speed on top of crap and the kids fall apart. Right. Right. So I feel like the, but that's what sells. So there's a problem with the marketing, social media type of stuff is feeding some of these injuries for sure. There's, uh-huh. And even the people that do, I mean, all of us know this, right? But it's, it's, it's not sexy to go, let's go spend two years, build a foundation, get your strength, what the best players did, and then add speed. They're like, no, I want it now. Right. So, so well, they got to they got to try out next week. So, yeah, they gotta, I mean, because I love I'm a huge fan of weight belt, but we apply it at the right time. We don't put speed on top of crap. I mean, right. that's just you don't try and build a skyscraper without a foundation. It just it's not going to work. You can try. It's just not going to work. Right. Right. So so that that's a huge problem. And then let's get to mechanics. You know, name. A, have, you know, how to throw a curveball. Uh, no, but I mean, I could, if I had to, I could, you could figure I could probably make it happen. Yeah. Well, let's just put it this way where your hand goes on this ball, right? Your hand size, of your hand as an adult is, is still difficult for some people to get their hand in the right position. You have no chance as a seven year old, right? The size of your hand trying to get the pitch fingers in the right position. This is one of the only sports where we don't have size appropriate implements, mm. right? So in baseball, little kids are put, throwing American baseball. You know, even in soccer, we have a size three yeah. ball, size four ball. In, a, in tennis, they use different. Everybody has a different golf. We use shorter clubs. And it's like giving a driver, a full men's driver to a six-year-old. I'm like, bad stuff's going to happen, right? So trying to throw some of these pitches, I believe, with Full size balls can definitely lead to some of these. Like you have to squeeze harder. You have to do. There's more activation of muscles going through there to try and get these pitches. So, I would say age appropriate pitch is important. Or teach them how to do it with an appropriate implement. Mm. Like right. I would love to have a smaller baseball and teach them how to do these things and then progress as they get older because that would I think that'd be way healthier. Right. So you're on base you that's going to be on this facility in a year. Our we'll lab have, that we're building. Your yeah, lab. Yeah. So you're going to have force plates. I'm ass- everything. The whole the whole deal. So then, um, but do you think you'll be breaking down pitching mechanics like you kind of did with the golf swing? With we TPI? already do that here. Okay. Oh yeah. So we are, we have our temporary lab that we've been using. Like we have close to 15 teams that we have players that come in and we do. We have we probably have one of the highest biggest database of baseball players in the world here on on stuff like that. So uh, yeah, we I mean our database on baseball is massive here and. Uh, we're already seeing all these things. Like the things I'm mentioning to you are things that I'm I'm witnessing every day. Right. And and uh, you know, and I also wanted to say if anybody's listening, like you know, a lot of times there's this like rite of passage. Now, once you get Tommy John, you come back, you're two miles an hour faster. Well, nobody says that. You know, 30, 30 some percent of those don't come back. Yeah. So this isn't like oh, let's just get it over with so we can go. Like you might be done when that happens. Be right. careful. Do you think in uh, like present day contemporary golf that the Tommy John of golf is the low back? Like, I mean, or is it not sure. that big of? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in golf, that's our number one injury. I mean, you're bending and twisting at high speeds. It in range. And you know, everyone's like, oh, if I could just swing like a tour player, I wouldn't have back problems. Tour players have back problems. So <laughs> bending and twisting is nature of our sport. So I always say, listen, if you know you're going to war, you just have to prepare for war. If you're going to be lazy and just drink beer and go over there, you're going to have back problems. Mm-hmm. Right. Bending and twisting is, is difficult for a lot of people, right? And if you have poor hip mobility, poor spine mobility, the lower back says, well, I'll take care of it. Well, it wasn't designed to do that. So right. lower back tries to do all the rotation movement, you're going down, right? And just remember, if your lower back's in pain, usually it's the result from it working too hard. And it's usually the hips and the other parts that aren't working that are causing this. So, I mean, in the name, it's obviously Titleist Performance uh, Institute. So one, one way people get here is because they want to perform better on the, on the golf course. What about from how often do you, you know, injured golfers come here to you? That's like, probably the number one thing that's we That's the see. number one thing. Yeah. Like when, when some of our players go down, uh, I, whenever I get a phone call, it's always, I'm no. always <laughs> like, uh-oh, what happened? Because, like, you know, it's, it's, I'd say. Like when a patient calls you, I don't know what you did. But. <laughs> exactly. But that's, you know, one of our things with our players, obviously, just like any of the medical staff and any team is to keep our players playing. I mean, the reason we pay our players is we want them on TV with their hat out there. It's like, we don't want them on the sideline, right. right? And so anytime players are injured, they know we probably have more data than anybody in the world on players with these injuries and we can kind of help them. You know, we, like we just went through this with Will's Altors. With, so Will went down during the FedEx Cup playoffs. I mean, we're talking won the first one and then went down. I mean, that's a big, that's a bad time to go down, right? And, you know, I explained this to Will and I explained this to a bunch of players. You know, Will's in his early 20s, right, or mid-20s, and I, and I go, name another sport where you can make millions of dollars in your 60s, right? So I want you to understand, like, 
this sometimes is great. It's great as a wake-up call when you're young mm-hmm. that we're not trying to keep you healthy for the next 10 years. We're trying to keep you healthy for the next 40 years. Right. It's think, different than baseball, yeah. I, I mean, dude, it's totally different. Yeah. Like, And by the way, everyone's like, baseball is the worst volume, you know, 160 days. Golf has more volume. Right. We play five days a week. For the whole, there's only four weeks off. At least right? five days a week. At, at, exactly, exactly, <laughs> at least. And so I'm going... And they're going to do it for 60 years if you're good, right? I mean, for at least 40 years. Like, so they're going to, if they start competitive really when they're 19 or 20 and they're going to go to their 60, I mean, that's, how do you keep an athlete going for 40 years? I mean, you got to realize that, hey, listen, this is not like, hey, we're going to do this little Band-Aid here. This needs to be a way of life mm-hmm. or you're going to, you're going to leave a lot of money on the table. Right? Well, and it's kind of well written about. I mean, the the spinal position that Zal Torres puts himself in, I mean, just to watch it with your naked eye is just like, oh my God, that's insane. So then, I mean, is your, tell me about your approach. I mean, are you trying to make an attempt with him to... So what we do, this is with every player, not just Will, every player. Every player comes in with their team right. and he's got a great, one of the best teams yeah. on the planet that comes in, his coach, his trainer, and they come in. And first thing we do is we go, I don't want to be ignorant. How can I help? Well, first of all, let's see what we're doing. And they're like, you know, one of the things we want to do is we want to make sure we, we are attacking everything that we should be attacking. Yeah. You know, just, just sign of a great team, right? And uh, so what we do is we put them on our what, why, and how devices just to see what you're doing, right? And then we go, all right, here's what we're seeing. And based on our research, these are the things that could really exponentiate back injury. Are you addressing some of these? And on their their case, it was, yes, we, we kind of see these things. It's great to get confirmation. We added one. I mean, literally, he was here for a while, and we added one little tweak that they were like, that's great. Because what little things make a big difference, oh, right? Yeah. So, uh, and uh, I mean, that's pretty, pretty much our role is just uh, we're the support. We're the... We're the mechanic, right? So the, the, the crew comes in and goes, hey, can you inspect the car real quick? Just make sure we're doing everything right and do stuff. And if there's anything we can add, we try and add. And the cool thing about us is we've seen every car. So we kind of know, you know, we can steal things from other ones and go, hey, this worked for this car. You should try this, blah, blah, blah. And that's a huge advantage. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, Tiger notoriously reinvented his swing. I don't know how many times, you know, when he was number one in the world. Yeah. Do, you think, do you feel like that's something that a lot of pro golfers are able to do? Like, can they make a, a pretty major swing change and... Uh, uh, yes, they can do it, but major swing change to them is not a major swing change to you. And yeah, me, right. They're right. little little tweaks. But I would tell you too, like I've never personally worked with Tiger, but I know a lot of his team that have worked with Tiger because he was wrong company. So he was with Nike. Yeah, yeah right. wrong company. But, the um, bad guys. Uh, but um, he who shall not be named. <laughs> but but uh, um, you know, I I think that. Uh, you said he changed his swing a bunch of times. I think he had to change his swings a bunch of times. I think his body injuries yeah. forced him to change his swing. Right. Right. So um, I, I think it's just the perfect example of why you always want to know what you can physically do and make sure that you're not trying to do something that's against your physical abilities. Right. That always makes everything really hard. Well, what do you think about, I mean, Tiger in his heyday when he was training quite a bit, I mean, and he was pretty muscled up, quite honestly. Yeah. The present, I mean, if you look at like Rom right now, yeah. they, they almost have almost like a dumpier look to them. Do you think, I'm not saying he's not strong. Did you just call John Rom dumpy? Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I think this is, what do you, uh, that's what I was talking about originally about this physique change that we see, you know, on some of these new present day great players. But again, Will's probably more like a tiger build, right? So I think you have different ways. I think to, you have different, there's a million ways to skin a cat. Yeah. Right? Like, you know, I always say there's three ways to develop power, right? In any sport. If you take all the research on power, there's three, and everybody wants to hit it farther. Or do something, it's, there's three ways. Power, if you look at it from a physics standpoint, is force times velocity, right? That's strength and speed, right? So if I want to hit a ball farther, of course you can get stronger. Apply more force to the club. Right. That, that's one way. Number two is move your hands faster, apply more velocity. So you can get stronger, you can get faster. Well, the good news is there's a third way. The third way is apply that power, that force and velocity for more time. In other words, like if you take a player and you put them on, like, say, a rotary chair one foot away from a wall. If I stand behind you and you're standing on that chair and I push you into the wall from one foot away, I could hurt you, but I couldn't kill you. If we move 30 feet away from the wall and I had 30 feet of running time, I could do some serious damage now because I have more time to apply that force and velocity. This is where a bigger backswing gives the players more time to apply force and velocity in the club. This is where Bubba Watson uses time and distance to apply more force. Where John Rahm's short swing, he's just brute. He's strength and speed on top of it, right? Right. So different body types might be more appropriate to develop the strength. Certain body types might be more appropriate to build the length to be able to apply time. So we, we always say there's three ways to skin a cat here. We can, you know, the long drive does all three. 
<laughs> you know what I mean? They, they, right. they, They're they, doing everything. All three of them, right? Um, John has always, you know, he grew up playing high lie, and he, he's all, he always learned to do stuff from short little swings, and he just learned how to create incredible strength. He's like big, powerful, strong kid. He's got tons of flexibility. He can go farther. He's just learned to do this, and he's just fast and powerful from those short ranges, and he just doesn't need it. Well, and he's got some anatomical limitations too, right? He's got a right or- ankle. He's got a right ankle that was born with club foot. But the good news is we know that. The, yeah, as a coach, yeah. so we just coach around that. That's no problem. We put shoes that try and help support this and do stuff, and and we play to his strengths. What about then, I guess, in the gym setting? Um, I, I To me, players are, are leaning more towards, I guess, training rotation, training in three planes of motion rather than maybe where Tiger was training more brute strength or Olympic lifting, things like that. Um, what, Science what's your training take? has changed a lot. Yeah, yeah. So what, what's your what's your take on the, uh, the latest and greatest? And let's just say training well, rotation you, and I, athlete. Yeah, I can tell you the latest and greatest that a lot of people aren't talking, that nobody's talking about that. I, know. I, I feel like there's been this um, huge influx of information from the how the force play and i honestly feel like i can count on two hands the amount of people who really understand how to read force plates and what's happening but now that now that we're understanding how athletes create the power from the ground we started going into our force plates about a year and a half ago um and i lectured on this about perform better last year on this is we started taking some of our exercises with our athletes, we know what their ground reaction force signature looks like in their swing. So we started looking at some of their drills that they do in the gym, like some of their medicine ball drills. And lo and behold, it's 80% of them weren't even close, right? So we, we we're actually trying to match ground reaction forces with our gym exercises to what they produce in their swing now. And it's, it's pretty radically different yeah. thinking. Like when you go look at, you know, if I watch you do a shovel pass, like you just like a shovel pass or a shot put, you know, you might do that differently than you do that. But I also want to know, like, does that match what you do when you actually swing a golf club? Because if it's different, that's probably maybe maybe the shot putt's not good for you, but maybe the shovel pass is. We try and pick the things that match your ground force reactions, and we get huge carryover on those. But is it safe to say that the longest hitters on tour are putting more force into the earth or not necessarily? On the, on the, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, there's there's... there's there's six ground reaction forces, but there's four that we feel make the biggest difference in the world. There's a lateral force right to left. Mm-hmm. So pushing from a right-handed player, I'm going to push uh, with my right foot to the right. The ground reaction force is going to push me to the left, right? And then obviously when my left foot hits the ground, it's going to push to the left and it's going to break going this way. So there's a lateral force, right? And then there's a vertical. Some of the best players in the world are pushing down hard into the ground, creating almost like a vertical jump in their swing to create the centripetal acceleration. So there's a huge vertical. That's usually the highest ground reaction force. It's vertical. Um, we're looking at like over 200% of your body weight uh, pushing down in the ground. Some of the big long drive guys are three to 400% of their body weight. And, and then there's torques, right? So there's forces. These are like linear forces. And then there's torques. There's twisting, obviously, that's called horizontal torque, right? So great players create a right foot pushes one way, left foot pushes the other way, and create a, a horizontal torque or a twist. And then there's a, we call frontal plane torque, which I call rock and rolling, like uh, side bend, right? So there's a, a, a frontal plane torque or rock and roll. You got the best players in the world, what you'll see on the force plate is they first, they start to move lateral. So there's a right to left. As they shift their weight, they rock and roll. They do a little frontal plane torque. Then they start to twist. And the last thing they do is they jump, the vertical jump. And that sequence, that kinetic sequence of forces is so important. Like we look at on 3D, we look at something called the kinematic sequence, your movements and what moves first, what moves second. But the kinetic sequence of the forces and the, and the how the forces go, I think is potentially even more important because it creates the kinematic sequence. So we've been looking at all of our exercises to go, are, are we getting the proper kinetic sequence in these exercises, especially when we get the power exercises? Because I'm telling you right now, a lot of them aren't. A lot of yeah. them players are doing, and we're like, ooh, stop doing that. That's creating a bad kinetic sequence. So the science of exercise, I think, not many people, I don't, it's not I haven't seen a lot of people applying their science to the exercises they're doing and making sure it's matching what they're doing. That's, that's a big focus of ours now. Here. If you had to get rid of, maybe give us one of each, you had to get rid of one of the most popular uh, uh, things that you've, you've measured as far as train rotation and then add in one of your favorites, what would it be? Yeah, this, this is going to sound crazy because I'm, I'm one of the people that used to promote this all the time. This is good. Vertical jump. Okay, like vertical jump. Is I, have, I can show you a direct correlation between the higher you can jump and how far you can hit a ball, right? So because of that, we know the vertical ground reaction force is one of the most important things to hit the ball far. So what do we do? We train vertical jump, right? But 
the vertical jump in the golf swing is different than the way most people train vertical jump in the gym. Mm. When you do vertical jump, and if you're listening at home, you can, you can kind of do this right there. You can stand, if you stand up at home and you go to do a vertical jump, I say, okay, jump as high as you can jump. You're going to squat down and you're going to bring your arms down. Uh -huh. and then when I say jump, you're going to jump and your arms are going to go up. Okay. Now let me show you what a golf vertical jump does. So try, try this with me at home. Okay. Stand up. Okay. Now if I say squat, but as you squat, raise your arms up. Okay. So as you squat, you raise your arms up. Now, as you jump, I want you to drive your arms down. Okay, that's a golf jump, right? That's a baseball jump, right? That's a pitching jump, right? Rotary athletes, as they create the vertical ground reaction force, their arms are coming down into the implement. They're not going up. That is, it, I'm telling you, if you try this at home, you're going to be like, whoa, that's like ass backwards. Yeah. It's, like, like, it's like, it's really weird to do that. I love training. We call it our golf vertical jump. We do that now. We don't do a lot of classic vertical jump training for our rotary athletes. And I'm telling you, it's like light bulb goes off for a lot of these players. It's a big, big difference. And not, not, not maybe the easiest thing to... Actually, well, you can see me on video here. On yeah, this, on yeah, this thing. Yeah. So, so, like, so basically what I'm saying is like, if you go do a vertical jump, you know, normally you're going to go down and then you're going to jump, right? All I'm saying is if you go down like this, bring your arms up, and then as you jump, drive your arms down, right? Do that with a medicine ball. Now you're going to feel what Will Zalatoris feels when he comes in a downswing, right? The... The lower body ground reaction forces help drive the upper body down. And most players, the ground reaction forces are so late that they don't even have time to get to the implement. And it's just, it's not the same. Sure. And if you had to throw away one of the most common, uh, well, I guess you, you kind of added I, I put the two it. together. All right, all right. Like I would change, I would, I'd get rid of your vertical, your normal vertical jump and do a golf vertical Got jump. Got it. All right. He kind of tricked me on that. That was good. That was good. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. And then uh, I, I guess with those linear forces or, you know, your, your, resultant vector, I guess, whatever it might be, whatever you want to call it, going more vertical and down. Um, like how, what are some of the cues maybe that you're, you're the best coaches are using to cue that in the golf swing? Or like, do you have any, like during the, like, what are players feeling the best in the world when they do that? Really well? Yeah, I, I think, I think, all right, I'm going to answer this a couple. Well, my, here's my favorite way to answer. I, I feel like in golf, maybe more than baseball, but in golf, the lead leg is, is the, uh, is the winner. Okay. Okay. It's, yeah. it's going to almost do double the ground reaction forces, the trail leg, right? Literally, it's almost 2x over there. So getting that feeling of what it feels like for that lead leg, I think is critically, critically important. And this is going to sound crazy, but I think one of the best ways to create that feeling is we get them on rotary chairs. We use, if I show you our closet over here, we have about 17 different types of rotary chairs that we've experimented with all different ones because it's the closest thing that we can match the ground reaction forces. So we get them on a chair and we literally have them take their trail leg off, left leg on the ground, sit on a rotary chair and just push the chair backwards. Mm. Okay, if you just push the chair backwards and try and go back, don't break your head and fall off the chair, but basically, and don't do this on your mom's wood, uh, you know, wood, wood floors. <laughs> right. So you're gonna, you're gonna push the chair backwards. What you're gonna notice is, to do that, you're going to push from the ball of your foot, right? And the ball of the foot is going to push the ground forward, which the ground pushes back and makes you go back this way. If you do that a couple of times and then you do the same thing, you push, but you rotate and you twist. Uh -huh. And if you're a right-handed player, you'd be twisting to the left. If you're a left-handed player, you're twisting to the right. If you do that little push, that little feel, you will feel what the best players in the world feel like with their lead foot. And this is true of baseball or golf too. And what, what I get to is most people think the back leg is the power and the front leg is the brake. It's like, here's the gas pedal and here's the brake pedal. What do you think? Well, most people think, I'm going to drive off my back leg and this is the brake. Mm -hmm. The best, biggest, most powerful players in the world, this is your gas pedal, the lead side. Changing that mentality to gas pedal over here. Actually, this is a gas pedal and this is a gas pedal. Because yeah. really what's happening is this is the gas pedal for linear motion. This starts linear. This thing stops linear, so it does break linear but it's the gas pedal for rotation. It creates the rotational torque that everything goes through and getting that feeling, I think is critically important for all, all players. I think given, given uh, the players, the imagery of what that feels like, my mm -hmm. guess would be the average person who does that test would probably be blown away and shocked that that's actually what's going through their Dude, body. When you, when you do that, I'm telling you, I've seen this on so many different players at all different levels. When you put them on a chair and you push the chair backwards and they're like, why are we doing this? You're like, don't worry about it. Just, just do this push back as far as you can. We have a little competitions. We see you push back harder. 
and I hem a bat or hem a club. I say, now stand up. Okay, okay. I say, okay, you got that feeling of pushing the chair? I go, I want you to take your backswing, and as you start your downswing, just push the chair backwards and rotate. When they do it, the first thing on their face, they'll look at you because the club goes like 10 miles an hour faster. They're like, oh my God, I've never, I can't believe how fast that club moved. I'm like, yeah, it's because your ground reaction force has happened earlier, and they transferred into your upper body and it goes flying, and then it's like they just want to run out and try and hit balls, like immediately. Yeah, like, it's just the worst. You know, you can tell somebody getting these positions, that's not the same as I can feel it now. Feels everything. What about, I mean, are you ever worried about, like, uh, messing with uh, the golfer's timing? Like, when you start working on some of these drills? Oh, I'm drills? definitely messing with their timing. Yeah. That's the problem. Most people, their timing's too late. Their ground reaction forces are late. And it's like an epidemic out there. Most amateurs' ground reaction forces are so late, they don't even have time to get to the club, so they just upper body, right? If we can get these earlier, you can feel what I'm talking about. You can feel the, the lower body generating the speed. It's like... You, you're cracking a whip from the middle of the whip. Mm. As soon as they feel the handle, they're like, man, that was, that was way easier. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's light bulb for people. So what do you think? Uh... Like, I'll say this totally off topic, but in motor learning, they talk about intrinsic versus extrinsic uh, things. Have you guys ever yeah. done any lectures? Yeah, of course. So a lot of people are like, oh, if you want to help somebody, they got to think extrinsically. If you think intrinsic, it's worth... I'm telling you right now, if you're, Extrinsic is like, okay, uh, hit it uh, over that tree, okay? And your intrinsic is, okay, uh, start with your right elbow going down. I agree, extrinsic is going to be better. Oh, so like internal, external cueing, that yeah. whole... If instead, if your internal cueing was, I'm going to show you what it feels like, I think that's better than extrinsic. Right. If you can show, if you can show me feel versus just tell me to do this... Oh, that whole, in my mind, that whole research integration is just blown out of the water. You need context to the situation. You yeah, know, like, there's a, there's a lot everyone of re- thinks there's, externals. There's, there's a lot of research that, that's been out that says that, hey, if you're going to try and help a player, give them external cues, yeah, exactly. not internal cues. And so people have thrown away the internal cues. I'm telling you right now, none of the research is done. If you actually go in and give them feels versus just tell them, like, yeah. move your right knee in. But if you show them what it feels like for the best players to do it, yeah, I, it usually beats external in our experience here. Yeah. That's Smart. that's like, people would be like, well, this guy's crazy. I'm just telling you, go try it. Context matters. I Context think, yeah, matters. Absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Uh, well, you gave us this awesome tour of this facility, but then uh, you basically gave us a tour and said, well, we're going to blow it up here pretty soon. So uh, can we talk about the future of TPI yeah. and so, what, what's, what's yeah, happening what's really, here? What's really, really cool is, um, obviously golf has exploded during COVID. It's the perfect social distancing sport, right? So a lot of people <laughs> got introduced to the sport. So golf's been expanding. And uh, Tylus is obviously uh, using this opportunity to help expand some of the services that we offer out here. So uh, we brought in the golf course ar- architect from Bandon Dunes to help us. We're going to build a whole new nine hole track here at our facility. Cause you know, when you fit somebody, a lot of times when you fit them, you're like, we've done our best job. We think, but go try it. Yeah. Give us some feedback on tour. We have a, a trailer that follows around and tweaks it if we need to. It's going to be great. Now we can go, well, let's go play a couple of holes and just see if it works. We have, we had our nine holes here that are coming in, which is going to be awesome. You actually did that because you were saying you you only hit balls in the, in the <laughs> simulator, but now you're actually going to be able to go out yeah, and play I, with I know where that, I know where you're going. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. Just listen. No, I'm working. <laughs> yeah. Honey, I'm working. I'm not here right now. Okay, so we get, so we have that. And then what I'm really excited about is, uh, you know, we are, Tyus has always been so great about sporting any of the research. And I always say, you know, a lot of the great technology you see in other sports, like TrackMan in baseball or KVEST and ba- all these things coming into different sports, started here in golf, right? And the reason they started in golf, I always say, is because if you look at most of those sports, most of those sports, their biggest budgets are player budgets, right? MLB, it's, of course, owners run that sport and they buy players. Well, there's no owners in golf. There's manufacturers, right? In golf, we spend our money on research and development. So our R&D budgets look like they're player budgets, right. right? So we get all these cool toys and develop stuff. MLB's probably got it right. They let the golf spend all <laughs> yeah. the money and then they grab <laughs> the ones smart ones. Work, right? So, but Tyus has always been like, what, is there any technology out there? What can we do to keep continuing this, this R&D? So we have, we have five motion capture labs that we're bringing in here that I'm really excited about. We have an entire, we're bringing in our entire baseball on base U science center here where we're going to have uh, hitting cages, instrumented mounds, uh, two, two, Four, two uh, 3D motion capture. We even have the markerless and markered systems. Um, pretty much anything you could think of right now to be able to test. That's we're, we're upgrading to the latest and greatest, even though we have a lot of that here, but it's just going to be cool to have those separate areas. Um, yeah, it's a whole new gym coming in. Life Fitness has been a great partner of ours forever, and we always get the latest and coolest stuff from them. And uh, yeah, just, uh, I just 
wish it would happen faster. Yeah, you know, it sounds like it's almost always... going to have like a campus or almost like an IMG feel. It is. Of, we have our yeah. Tylus University that we're coming in. It'll be a hundred person auditorium where we can do some of our seminars here. We have a whole new filming studio that we're coming in here. It's definitely going to be the campus feeling here. Yeah, so it's, good. it's, it's really cool. Will there be housing here? Like, will the, man, I want, we want it. David that, and I yeah. we were like, we'd it, love to have housing, but no, we're not going to do housing. We have our new tour, tour department building where we have like a tour lounge and a place where teams can, uh, players can bring their teams in for meetings and stuff. That's going to be here. Um, but, uh, the good news, we have two Marriott's at the end of the range over here. So, yeah, uh, that works out okay. Yeah. <laughs> a decent yeah. option. Yeah. And uh, you're looking right at the ocean. Exactly. Too, so, I mean, it's not, not a horrible, horrible yeah. place. To exactly. Be when we started, we, uh, we were just kind of a uh, bullshit and you said you've had a crazy three weeks. I've had a crazy three yeah. weeks. You want to so, talk about that? I would love for you to talk. I, Cause it's such a fascinating story. You telling the story and I think yeah, there's actually, a lot no, of lessons. To learn no, there's definitely, it. you're never too old to learn a lot of stuff. And I've learned a lot in the last three weeks. Um, so just to give you a little context, uh, so three weeks ago I was in Arkansas. I spent half my little over half my year in fifty one percent, at least fifty one percent. Now my wife's from Little Rock, and we have a great place there, and it's kind of my that's where I go to think, and that's where my my happy place. And uh, not that this is, <laughs> I got two great happy places. Uh, right, yeah. But I was I was out there and doing a lot of crazy work on the farm. I woke up on Sunday morning. I was supposed to fly to California in the morning. Felt some felt what I felt a little palpitations in my chest and uh, got up to get out of bed and my legs didn't participate and I hit the ground. Now I didn't pass out, but I felt very dizzy and I was like, what the hell was that? I get back in the bed and I'm like, oh, I think I just worked too hard yesterday. Like most guys would say, you know, I think I just overdid it. Maybe I'm not, didn't eat much. I'm like, let me just get up slower. So I got up slower. I was able to not fall down this time. I get to the kitchen, I get some food. I'm just feeling a little bit better, but not much. And I'm there by myself, by the way. I'm supposed to be flying back. And fortunately, an incredible father-in-law, he shows up, keeps going to take me to the airport. And he looks at me and he goes, dude, are you okay? And I'm like, I don't know. I don't, I don't feel right. And he's like, you don't look right. He goes, here, sit down. And he's like, what's going on? And I'm like, you know, I'm feeling a little dizzy. And, he's, and he goes to me, he goes, uh, you think I should take you to the hospital? And I'm like, you know, normally, us, I'm like, no, nah, we're good. Yeah. Right. And I looked at him, I go, you know what? Maybe we should. And he's like, that's enough for me. Get your ass in the car. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, we, go. so we go to the hospital and I end up in the hospital and they put an EKG on me and I'm in atrial fibrillation. I'm an AFib, right? Which, you know, uh, I know a little bit about, but I know a lot more about it yeah, now. now. Than yeah, with AFib. And uh, basically my atrium were going like 210 beats per minute. Ventricles were going normal. So like when you're checking your pulse, like I know my pulse was a little high. It was like 75, right? Which is high for me, but it felt normal. It's because the ventricles were normal, but the atrium were going crazy, mm-hmm. right? So um, I get in there and the doctors are like, you know, hey, this is very common. He goes, one of the doctors goes to me and goes, uh, you know, causes of this can be multiple things. He goes, uh, number one, thing usually is some type of sleep deprivation he goes do you travel a lot or different time zones and i'm like uh yes like 40 (laughs) weeks a year for 20 years and he goes how much do you sleep and i'm like i'll see doc i go i probably sleep less than five hours every night for the last 30 years Right. And, you know, like I said, I I think this is a great learning lesson for people who have sleep sleep problems. I think there's a lot of us that do this. I can fall asleep anywhere, but I wake up. Right. And he's like, listen, he starts showing me some of the stats. He's like, you know, uh, stats are not in your favor that if you sleep less than five hours, a lot of times we can get some serious cardiac problems. And I'm like, good to know. So uh, he gives me some medicine, says, you you know, I can feel when my AFib goes away. It took two hours and I'm like, I'm back to normal. I feel great. And he's like, he's like, you need to go talk to your cardiologist, maybe start working on some of your sleep and some of that stuff. Usually he discharges me. So I was there for three hours. I get up with my father-in-law to walk out. I get to the desk at the ER. I look at my father-in-law and I go, I don't think we should leave. He's like, what do you mean? I'm like, I don't know. I don't feel right. And I go, can you get the nurse? And I kneel down. Next thing I wake up with 12 paramedics around me, shock paddles on, mask on. I literally coded in the floor of the ER, heart stopped for almost 45 seconds. Um, so I'm, I'm back from the dead. Yeah. Here. It was, obviously I'm, I'm making a jest of this, but it was, it was pretty scary. And they were like, obviously you're not going anywhere. Uh, what the, you know, what the hell just happened? I think just to be honest, I feel like they gave me some medicine to get me out of AFib to slow my heart rate down. Well, it worked. It, when I stood up, it literally crashed. But your heart's never supposed to stop, right? So they explained to me, they're like, listen, you've got this AFib problem, but when we gave you this stuff, you know, you can pass out. But even when you pass out, your heart's supposed to keep beating. You're stopped. There's something wrong. We need to figure it out. So they did echo on me. They did, you know, CAT scans, all stuff. And they're like, we can't find anything. Everything looks great. 
They were like, you know, we're going to put a monitor on you. You can wear this monitor for four weeks. And I said to them, I go, I don't, I don't want to leave here until I, like, I, don't, I want some answers. Like, <laughs> yeah, so I, yeah. I'm like, can we do a stress test? And they're like, sure, we can do a stress test. So I get on a, he agrees to that. And I get on a treadmill. And 10 minutes into the treadmill stress test, I code on them again. I literally pass. <laughs> oh, I, I step off the treadmill, completely collapse. But this time they have the EKG on me. And, and they diagnosed me with something called sick sinus syndrome, which is basically you have the SA node. Um, that's kind of controls the electrical beat of your atrium that goes into the ventricle. And uh, he goes, something we see on a lot of people with sleep deprivation is is it wears out this electrical system. He goes, uh, we need to go make sure that there's no blocks, blockages in your heart. So they took me in the surgery right when I came through. They, they were wheeling me into the cath lab. They do an angiogram. The guy's like, dude, your arteries look crystal clear. I, you know, I, I think I eat right, do something. He's like, whatever you're doing is great. There's nothing wrong with the plumbing. He goes, but your electrical system, <laughs> we, got, we got some problems. <laughs> so they proceeded to give me a pacemaker. And I now am the proud recipient of a pacemaker, which I never thought I'd have at 52. But um, the procedure went great. The doctors were great. Um, it's on demand. If I ever, So I'll never get to the point where it, it stops again. And now I, I just have to solve the atrial fib problem, which I think is a sleep problem. And... Uh, you know, I always say these types of things uh, lead to uh, um, good things. I'm going yeah, to learn a lot yeah. more about sleep, and I'm already learning a ton about sleep. I'm doing a sleep study right now where they're watching you sleep. They hook you up, trying to figure out why you wake up and stuff like that. But, you know, if any of you sound like me and you're not sleeping and you've been doing this for 10 years, don't be like me. Don't do that for 30 years. <laughs> do it now, Because right? you right. can definitely mess with your... Definitely a learning lesson. Well, I mean, Brett and I, we talk about it a lot. I mean, we're, we, we, you know, stress. Stress yeah. is no, no. Uh, it's the other thing. I never feel like I'm stressed. I, I honestly, I, well, look what I do. This is so much fun. I mean, how, if you stress doing this, I'm sorry. You got yeah, well, <laughs> like this, I, every job has stress, but this is a good type of stress, sure, right? And I've never felt like stress, but I honestly, I just, I don't know why I wake up. Mm -hmm. I don't know why I sleep. Maybe I'm just excited to go to work and I, that's why I'm getting up. Or excited, But, uh, um, and, I, and I've learned a lot about like, you know, people are like, oh, you just take some medicine to go to sleep. Sedation is not the same as sleep, right? So I know that for sure. They've, they've made that very clear. We can give you all this stuff. It won't make any difference. You have to get real sleep. Right. And that's that's a journey that I'm going to go on here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what a welcome journey. And I know I, I, I listened in pretty well because yeah. I, I sleep good, but not not great. So it'll be something that we, we work on. But then I probably uh, freaked out some of you listening at home. But no, you know, no. Sleep, but, I, you know, I, I feel like that's what it takes. You Sometimes you need a wake up call to go, all right, I got to solve this. This is a problem that, you know, I think I think of myself. I'm like, I feel like I do. I work out. I eat right stuff. And I'm like, and sleep's going to knock me out. Is that right. like, that's like, the thing. I think it's the American way, though. People brag about not sleeping or, you know, that they're working so hard. And uh, not that that's you. But I'm just no, saying, it's definitely that, you me. know, like it's kind of because I used to have that too when I was young. It was just sleep. You know, you can sleep when you're dead. Yeah, it's I a always say you're not going to beat me because I'm going to outwork you. Mm. Yeah. That, but I'm like, that was my motto. Not a good motto. Yeah. Right? I, I, <laughs> come totally to, find, come to find out. Yeah. <laughs> the body yeah. keeps the score, as they say, right? That's, That's exactly it. right. That's well, uh, I, I just think uh, what a cool facility. What an amazing thing you've built. I mean, congratulations. I know you got to go to bed at night sometimes and try to pinch yourself and say, wow, this is this. Oh, yeah, I just don't go to bed at night. No, I know. Right. Yeah, you're <laughs> thinking about stuff. But uh, <laughs> I, I, we can't wait to come back in a year and see the new facility and see what it brings. But uh, any, other, any other passion projects outside of uh, uh, of golf and baseball that we talked about that you're kind of uh, really, really excited about and stuff like that. <laughs> and sleep. Yeah, there's, and sleep. There's obviously. a lot, but the people around me who love me are trying to stop me. From yeah, right, stuff. right. But no, we're, we're always doing some really cool stuff. Um, our, this year at, at TPI, um, we're actually doing a whole overhaul of all of our certifications. Really excited. We're bringing all of our experts in, redoing a bunch of that stuff, which is always cool. To, yeah. Once you do it, you always like, I can do that better. So we're doing a bunch of those. We're launching some new classes in our baseball um, side on base. We have our pitching level two, hitting level two. We were just doing filming the last four days here um we got even have a in our tennis program racket fit we're launching our ground strokes course and uh, uh a lot of people don't, don't know but a lot of the on base racket fit tpi were three separate companies and now all under the Talos umbrella so a, a lot of the shared resources now from our apps and stuff are all going to be applied to all three which is some really cool stuff coming with us here. So it keeps us. Well, and if somebody's interested in taking courses or, or you know, getting more information about this, what, what's the best way to go? MyTPI.com. We have tons of free information on there for anybody. So my, my Titles Performance Institute, MyTPI.com. If you're interested in the baseball stuff, it's OnBaseU.com. Mm -hmm. And if you're into tennis, RacketFit.com. 
And all of those have the information. Yeah. And what has us- to happen, yeah. Greg, in the next hundred years for when we're dead and gone, a hundred years from now, how do you guarantee that this place is still doing what it's doing? Dude, when I die, this place is going to the ground. Nobody's out here. No, so, no. Dude, like I said before, the, to, to, <laughs> if you create systems, right, if you create systems, the systems run whether you're there or not, mm-hmm. right? To me, that's the, the, you know, if you, if I open up Greg's chiropractic practice and I'm the, I tell everybody I'm the best and people come in and see Greg's chiropractic practice, it's going to work if you're good, right? Then you're going to get to the point where your entire calendar is full. We've all been there, right? Yeah. And then you're at the point where you're like, okay, you can either raise your rates or you can do more hours. Well, nobody raises their rates. So they're like, oh, I'll meet you at seven in the morning. The next thing you know, <laughs> six you guys, 30, six, it's five thirty to 10 PM. And now you don't see your family or anything. You're just working all these crazy hours. So then you say, I need help. I need to get somebody to help. So you try and hire an associate, right? You guys been through this? Okay, so you, so you, so, I'm your so, so yeah. Okay, so, so you <laughs> this hire, is my so, life. Okay, yeah, so you, you hire an associate and now you tell your patients, Hey, you should go see my associate. Well, they've been referred because you told everybody for the last five years that come to Brett's uh, chiropractic clinic, come to Greg's chiropractic, we're the best, right? So everybody's referring, you got to go see Greg. And they're like, no, I don't want to see, you know, Joe Smith over here. I, I was told to see you. They're like, oh no, but Joe's great. And so now they're going, well, either you lied for the last five years saying you were the best or you're lying now that you want me to go see over there. And, and, and it's really hard to change that. Yeah. Like, really hard. So I'm always like, just don't, Start that way. Start with a system where it does. You're not going to see a person. You're going to see a TPI certified professional. You're going through a TPI system. And if they run the system, it works. I think that you know the one word after sitting down with you for the last yeah. uh, hour or so is scalability. You yeah. figured out how to scale well. That's what any great business has to do that. Yeah, and I think a lot of people they really, when it comes to that delegation and things like that, they really struggle. That's Therefore, hard. they can't scale. Well, it's hard to delegate if you don't have a system. Because you're, you're assuming like, oh, they're, no one's good as me. I'm like, well, then you didn't write your system down. You, you're just a bad teacher. You're not teaching them how to do your system. A good teacher can teach someone how to do their system. If, if, it, if it requires you to do this, it's gone when you're dead. You yeah. sound like an e-myth disciple. Are you or not? Oh, I'm a huge e-myth fan. Yeah, it sounds like Mark King. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's just common sense to me. Yeah, right? yeah. You know what I mean? I feel like well, that's... Because that's like the book that... That's like the Bible of systems. I think it's, everybody should read that book if you're yeah, going to start your own business. That, Give that, us that, another one, though, on systems besides that one. If you don't have one, no big deal. Um, a non-clinical great book that changed your life. Um, well, this isn't a system book, but uh, you said changed my life. Uh why people sleep, Scott Walker. Now. Yeah, that, that's going to change. <laughs> Too um, soon. No, there's. Uh, what's the one with the elephant, the rider, the change, change psychology? Have you read a lot of the change psychology books. Uh-uh. Um, ah, it's going to kill me. What's the name of that book? Uh, <laughs> oh, wow. Um, as soon as we stop, I'll remember it. But um, there, we'll put in the look. If you look, yeah, if you look at the change psychology out there, um, you know, getting people to change. Is a very big challenge, right? And there's uh, lots human of human behavior is similar. Yeah, and uh, John Berardi's a big fan of some of these too. And I think he's yeah. introduced me to this book. But um, and it's going to tell the tip of my tongue. I'm going to get. It. But uh, I I really feel like understanding that, like what what how humans think and how they how you can get them to do something because exercise and and diet are those are addictions. Right. And to get someone to change and change the way they do things, you really need to understand how to motivate humans and how to get them to move. So reading books on that, I think, because your system has to do that or yeah. else it's not going to work. Yeah. yeah. Man, I'm, I'm, I can't believe I'm blanking on the name, but we'll put it, you'll you put it in yeah, notes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Literally it was that press, good. I just, yeah, yeah I forgot to. Yeah. When I press, yeah. Report, when I yeah. press yeah. the button here to stop it. it, it <laughs> yeah. So yeah. it's all good. Well, uh, we, we've officially went an hour and a half. So great. Awesome. We, we kind of initially had planned on doing two and then just kind of evolved into one. And I thought it was perfect. So thank you for showing us this awesome facility. Thanks got for it. what you're doing for the chiropractic yeah. profession too. I mean, hey, uh, you we're, we're proud to be chiropractors. I know you are too. Absolutely. We're proud of, proud of our past and our history. And, and, uh, you can see it reflected here that, like I said, the awesome gods that, you know, that gods that bench, but a, a bench over here in chiropractic. Did you go to Logan? We're, I went to Logan. So, yeah. so we got, we got three Logan. different yeah. Yeah. colleges yeah. represented here too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we just arm wrestle for it? Yeah. So, uh, no, yeah. no Brett just does biceps all day long. So he, he's going to destroy it. So you went to Palmer High Five. Yeah, yeah you high did. High. You typed with your pipe. That's his name. Right. Uh, well, guys, check out mytpi.com. Uh, check out uh, whenever you get a chance to, to, to watch uh, Greg lecture. I mean, it's, uh, it's memorable. You've definitely taken time to be a good lecturer. 
with guys. you and, and uh, we really appreciate that. But uh, yeah, thank you for, for thanks, entertaining yeah, us thanks, and uh, we'll, we'll see you next time. Thanks. All right. Hope, well, uh, good luck to patience guys. This works and I'll still be here. Next yeah, time, yeah, know. absolutely. If not, this will be the last. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. All right, guys, we'll have a good day and uh, we'll talk. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Gasol Education Show. Uh, if you liked it, share it, subscribe to it, uh, send it to your friends, send it to someone that needs to hear this message. Uh, we really want everyone to be able to, to tune in and, and get the, the best clinical advice that they can, which uh, we're hoping that we're giving to you with these special guests. So um, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Or if you have any suggestions on upcoming uh, conversations, let us know. Uh, For a list of our upcoming courses, we're adding them all the dang time. So go to gestaltedu.com, click on courses, and they'll all be right there for you. All right, have a good day.